Welcome to chapter four. In chapter three, we looked at possible places to drill our first wildcat well based on the information and data that we acquired, processed, and interpreted. After having located some interesting possibilities in the exploration of sedimentary basins throughout the world, it is now time for you as the petroleum engineering operator to lease a tract of land that will give you permissions from the owners to actually work on the site. You'll need to be able to conduct tests and if signs are positive, you'll need to be able to develop the area. The first thing you want to do is get signed agreements so that you'll be assured of receiving your agreed upon profits, if there are any. As an operator, you will be representing one of three major oil companies. The first type is called an independent oil and gas company. Non-state owned, these private independent oil and gas companies are non-integrated, which means they receive nearly all of their revenues from oil and gas production at the wellhead. They are exclusively in the exploration and production segment of the industry and are found worldwide. The second type is an international oil company, or IOC, which is also non-state owned. An IOC is an international super major oil company like Exxon, Mobil, or BP. Together, IOCs control only about 6% of the world's oil reserves, but are present in most countries where oil exploration and production occur. Finally, the third is a national oil company or state-owned company of an oil-producing host country. Adnoc in Abu Dhabi or Paymex in Mexico are examples. Together, the NOCs currently control 88% of the world's oil reserves. Unlike the independents or IOCs, they rarely work outside their country's borders. Now let's pretend that you are an operator working for a super major international oil company. Your first task will be to acquire legal permissions to access and develop the site. These agreements ensure that you and the IOC you represent get the proper payout on your investment in time, expertise, and money. As you might imagine, the legal requirements to develop a track of land is different in different parts of the world. In the United States and parts of Canada, land rights, both surface and subsurface, can be owned by private individuals. In the rest of the world, the subsurface rights are owned by the sovereign government of those lands. This means that if you plan to drill in the United States or Canada, you will need signed leases with the owners, who may either be individuals corporations or governments. Elsewhere, you'll need sign contracts with only governments. Some of these host countries will have national oil companies, NOCs, and others will not. Sound confusing? Well, let's begin. In chapter four, we'll examine the framework of rules, regulations, and laws that govern the business of exploring and producing oil and gas throughout the world. We will describe how land with its mineral rights is owned in different parts of the world. Second, we'll explain how you, as an operator, would go about securing and working with leases on privately owned and state-owned land in the United States of America and portions of Canada. After that, we'll discuss securing and working with leases in the rest of the world and doing business with host countries where mineral rights are state-owned. Next, we'll highlight the differences of working with a non-oil producing host country and one that has been an oil producing nation long enough to have nationalized its oil and established a national oil company. After comparing and contrasting the goals and objectives of a national oil company, an NOC, with an international oil company, an IOC, we'll briefly mention reasons why NOCs and IOCs should and must put their differences aside to work together. Finally, we will name and describe the three basic contracts and agreements that are commonly used today in the international oil and gas industry. Throughout the world, there are complex 
variable laws about who owns the lands and the rights that this ownership conveys. As you remember from chapter one about geology, we defined the surface as different from the subsurface that you needed to understand about both to understand how the earth was formed. Likewise, when it comes to property ownership and rights, you need to understand that there are laws that pertain to the surface and others that pertain to the subsurface. There can be owners of the surface and different owners of the subsurface. As I mentioned earlier, these owners can be individuals, companies, and or governments. Sometimes only one of these entities will own both the surface and subsurface. Sometimes there will be multiple owners. It will be your job to find out who owns what and then negotiate with the appropriate parties for favorable terms. Keep in mind that the rights and obligations of landowners are dictated by the laws governing a particular country. Laws in Nigeria are not the same as those in Texas or in Iraq. For the most part though, throughout the world, the owners of the land can exploit or work the surface and the owners of the mineral rights can exploit or mine the minerals in the subsurface. In the United States and parts of Canada, much of the land and their mineral rights is privately owned. This means that if you want to drill there, there is a great likelihood that you will be meeting with and negotiating with private citizens, companies, or governments who own either the land or the mineral rights. In any event, to protect your interests, you'll need to find out who owns both the land and the mineral rights. Since mineral rights can and have been sold independently of the sale of the land, a study of the documents in a local courthouse should give you the names of the owners. State and federal governments in the United States and Canada also own and control large tracts of land that can be leased for mineral exploration. To award a lease, they put tracts out to bid. Out to bid means that they advertise the location of a parcel of land with the terms of the lease. These terms are usually fixed, which means that they are not subject to negotiation. On a given date, the governments award the leases to the operator agreeing to pay the highest price for the right to explore. With entities other than the government, you'll be able to negotiate a lease with an owner or owners of the land and the mineral rights. Working with private owners where there is more flexibility in the terms, you'll want to negotiate carefully about each provision and pay close attention to the wording used to define the terms and conditions. Lawyers, or paralegals, called landmen, can facilitate your negotiations. Now let's turn our attention to some terms and conditions that you'll need to understand before you begin negotiations with private entities. These terms will help you better understand the parameters of your rights and obligations and set out the terms and conditions for you to either develop the field if commercial oil and gas are found or to abandon the site if you drill a dry hole. Leases for mineral rights imply access and contain provisions for surface access. This means that you are allowed access to your well site and can build roads and engage in other activities allowing you to drill the well. The period of time that you are allowed to drill the well or wells is called primary term and means that you must establish commercial production within that period of time or you will lose the lease. The lease also usually conveys to you the right to continue production until the well is abandoned. In addition to stipulations about access and the period of time the lease is in effect, the lease will also set forth and limit the number of wells that can be drilled. The number of wells that you agree to drill during your lease is called your drilling obligations.